Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are with Amy Williams, a good friend of mine. We've known each other for about four years now from the promotional products industry. And we're going to talk about all things wellness and how we can really be leaders in our organizations to implement mental health and not just uh, talk about it, but be about it. So with that, before we get started, I just invite us all to drop in with some breath. So if you're driving or doing doing anything where you can't close your eyes, you can breathe with us. But otherwise, if you're able to just start to shut down the eyes, find a comfortable seat, closing the eyes with your feet on the floor, sitting straight up, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Through the mouth, sighing, letting it go. That's it. Just like that. Just feeling planted on the floor with your feet and your palms on your lap, sitting up and through the nose as slow as you can, inhaling all the way up and sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath, rolling back the eyes as if you were looking up into that space in between the eyebrows, releasing tension, continuing to hold the breath, and sighing it out, letting it go, letting it go, letting it out. And one more, slowly inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more at the top, Sip in a bit more, hold the breath, roll back the eyes, just feel. And through the mouth, exhaling, letting it go, let it go, let it go. Letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and just flickering the eyes open when you're ready. Just a few breaths like that, and we can shift some energy. 90 second rule. Amy, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Grounding with breath is one of my favorite things to do. And I practice that all the time. I try to get better at it because it really, really sets the tone for the next few minutes that you're about to explore in your daily life. Let's talk about that. Like how how long has that been a big thing for you? I started my breathwork journey last October, actually. I know I've done it intermittently over the last four years, but I really started the, to get serious about practicing breathwork last October and started working with um, a breathwork uh, specialist and an expert in that modality. And then also I take whatever seminar Sam Kabert has, I will do that. And uh, really just started this journey um, over the last 10 months. And it takes practice. It really does. That's awesome. And is there a specific uh, type of breath work that really helps you to just settle in and to rest and digest? 
honestly, I find the most impactful breath work journeys happen when I'm doing hypno breath work. Um, mm. It's very powerful. It's a big release for me. It's something that really, whatever challenge I'm trying to overcome or whatever challenge or decision that I have to make that's weighing on me, hypno breath work has been the quickest, most powerful and impactful way for me to release anything that I need to release so that I can get clarity on what I need to accomplish. Amazing. And and do you mind sharing a little bit what that looks like? Because there's so many different types of breath work um, practices out there. So hypno breath work, what does that look like? Hypno breath work, we're lying down on a mat. Um, we center with, with breath work. Um, I'm just, re- I, my most recent journey was a few weeks ago at a retreat in Colorado. So I'm just going through my mind, the steps, you know, and it can be an hour long session. Um, and music will be playing and the hypno ther- hypno breath work therapist will be um, guiding you through the steps all the way, um, giving you prompts to think about, um, giving you prompts for what type of breath you're, you're doing, you know, and massive inhale, massive exhale, sighing it out, but not just sighing it out, screaming it out and uh, thinking about whatever challenges that you're going through and they really do a fantastic, well, the ones that I've worked with have done a really fantastic job of getting me to the point where I can release any tension, release any um, negative energy that is weighing me down or preventing me from making big business decisions. So it's, it's the hardest of the modalities, I think for most people, but for me, Yes, it's hard, but it's the most impactful and the quickest way for me to get clarity on what I need to do. 100%. And you know, that's kind of like, not the joke, but the saying within the breath work field of like, like they call it work because it is work. And let's just go here because you're in my breath club that I'm doing now and hopefully you are learning a few things, but uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What are the uh, two types of breath work that I talk about? You talk about... Um, parasympathetic and sympathetic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest and the sympathetic nervous system are, is entering into fight or flight. So what Amy's talking about here with the hypno breath work journeys, this is one form of uh, breath work, which is a breath work journey, which is intentionally to activate, to simulate or stimulate fight or flight. So we can, release it from our actual body. And that's actually uh, exactly what you're talking about with hypno breath work. And I like to say those are the things like maybe we do it once a year, maybe once a quarter, maybe maybe once a month, but we don't necessarily do that all the time. The other form of breath work being breath work exercises, to your point, to shift into the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. Like we did at the top of this, right? Just taking a few simple breaths, something that we can do at any point in our day to become more mindful leaders and make a difference in our organizations, which is what we are here to talk about today, wellness. So that works perfectly just like that. So talk with us a little bit, your journey with wellness and what that's looked like within your own business, because you do have your own business. Is it something that you implement within your culture? You're even working with your clients, your vendors. What does it look like? Well, I think in order to be able to have it integrated successfully in one's company, it really starts at the top. And I started this journey actually with you, Sam, four years ago during the pandemic. It was an incredibly difficult time. Um, We had personal tragedies in our own family uh, during the pandemic, and I was beside myself and didn't know what to do. So started out with meditation and attended meditation webinars. And then from there, I was introduced to a group of resources and and experts that empowered me to start the journey of wellness. And I, I tried to do my best for three years, but I found that it's really more effective if you have a wellness coach. Um, someone who can guide you through the different modalities, someone who can, you know, check in on you and on, on the regular and make sure that you have all the necessary tools that are needed 
to have wellness. And I really went full in on my wellness journey last year. I decided to go all in and we incorporate, incorporated it into our company. And what that means is it's a line item in our budget, <laughs> you know, wellness, not just for the owners of the company, but for everyone who is involved or, or is a team member with our company has access to any type of wellness journey that they want to participate in. And we also do our best to make sure that we inform everybody at our company, hey, how are you doing? Let's check in. What what do you need to be successful, not only in your job, but what do you need to be successful in life? And that's something that we also take seriously at our company as well. So um, it's, it's really important, but it's an often forgotten element of corporate culture. And mm -hmm. how do we change that? That's that's the million dollar question. How how do we change that? Because uh, where I'm sitting, and I've shared this with you offline, it, it seems like so often companies are like talking about wellness or mental health, but it's just talk. There's not much action. And then when the action is taken, it's like maybe in the form of a stipend or something kind of like checking a box where it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing our part. Or maybe it's like perks that are indirectly towards wellness, but it's not really going beneath the surface and getting into like the shadow work that Carl Jung would talk about. And I uh, teach a lot. What do you think about like going into the depths of your psyche and how does that have uh, play a role in corporate? Like when is it too much and how, how can we actually go a little bit deeper inside of a business and the culture? You know, I honestly think that to back up a step, people won't promote or they won't engage in things they don't understand. And before I was enlightened and before I started working with all these different um, modality coaches, I didn't know anything about it either. I thought hypnotherapy meant it was a Vegas act. You know, I'm going right. to be walking around clucking like a chicken. That couldn't be furthest from the truth. You know, it's, that's not what it's about. And so Honestly, I think it comes from someone who's experienced, someone who can explain how this can help people. I know I'm living proof of the benefits of, of having a, a wellness program integrated into our own company. And I think once, once people truly see that change, because I know that my own husband has commented to me on several occasions how the difference that he sees how I'm making decisions now, how I arrive at decision-making processes, things that would send me over the edge, angry into a rage. Mm. Now it's taken with a grain of salt. And I worked very hard to get to that point in my career and in my life. And I wouldn't be able to do it without the experts in my life that can help guide me through that. So for companies, why wouldn't an HR department want to offer this as a benefit to their employees? Why wouldn't they want to have regular access to these types of modalities so that their employees will come in, you know, and if they're having a bad day or they're having a challenge and they don't know how to deal with it. And sometimes managers are, they're not experts, they're not doctors, they're not certified, you know, technicians and modalities. So if you, if a company doesn't want to offer an, an in-company program or an in-house program at least provide access to this information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I really resonate with the rage, the anger, you know, there's, when you said that there was a certain scene um, that played out in my mind that had to have been maybe eight years ago, if not longer, where I, I had a Bluetooth head, set like you know <laughs> do people wear those still i don't know but i remember taking it off and throwing it across um the room and that was probably the most aggressive i've ever been in terms of like a fit of rage in an <laughs> office type uh, setting but to your point like it is so easy to get enraged and for whatever the reason may be whether it's in our personal lives or our work lives like what actually has shifted in you like how do you now process that when you feel that enter into your nervous system now i have a toolbox <laughs> i literally have a toolbox and breathwork is one of them breathwork is one of the tools that i use 
I have resources in the form of um, experts in the, in the fields, in the modalities that I participate in in my wellness journey. So I have access to them, whether it's through a subscription-based model or whether it's I pay by the hour or whether I belong to a monthly program, you know, whatever that may be, I have access to the experts who can walk me through a challenge or a particularly difficult journey. And what's interesting about that is it's cyclical, Sam. If you have someone and it, and it starts it starts with the job it starts with the workplace if you have someone who's unhappy in their role unhappy in their job they come to their job and they're miserable they're not motivated they're unhappy and no matter what happens they're never going to be happy nothing in that job nothing that that employer could provide will make that person happier because they they need to be doing something else pursuing another passion um you know finding out what it is that they want to do but they feel like they're stuck so they go home to their families um, or roommates or whatever, and they're unhappy. And that translates into the home. Right. And so then everybody in that home becomes unhappy because the negative energy is is just palpitating. It's 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 growing, right? It snowballs. Then you have that family who's going out into the community unhappy, going to the grocery store, the post office, um, in line at FedEx or you know, in line for whatever. And, you know, something so minor can set them off. And all of a sudden you have a public spectacle because someone was unhappy and didn't know how to manage that unhappiness, didn't have the tools or the resources to be able to overcome some of those personal journeys. And for us, it became increasingly important to make sure that everyone in our organization was happy was enjoying the job that they do, was passionate about helping people, passionate about helping our clients, because our industry is very stressful and mm -hmm. everything can go wrong and anything can go wrong. And how do you manage that? What what tools do you have in your toolbox to be able to overcome some of these things? You know, breath work, experts that can help you, you know, go into a personal journey. And sometimes you don't have to go deep into shadow work. Sometimes it's as easy as, hey, Let's take five minutes and just breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's exactly what I teach in my new book, Overcome the Overwhelm with the six step breath process that I recently walked you through. It's it's five simple things. It's really simple. First, understand that emotions are energy in motion, meaning that these energies aren't designed to be stuck and stored in the body. But if we don't allow ourselves to feel it, it gets stuck and stored in the body. And that is the shadow work. And this is how quick the shadow work can be. This is the second thing, the 90 second rule. The 90 second rule teaches us that our bodies have a 90 second physiological response when we experience an emotion. This was uh, made famous by Dr. Jill Bolt, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, who was on Oprah's podcast and she was named to Times 100 top uh, influential people in 2008. She was recently a guest on my podcast, this one you're listening to now, Soul Seeker. So those are the first two things. At, Motions are energy in motion. And if you allow yourself to feel it, you can process it within 90 seconds. So to your point, Amy, it's like, yeah, you don't have to go like really deep on shadow work. You just got to allow yourself to feel it. So the next thing is like, all right, what do you do in those 90 seconds? And that's where the themes of breathe, feel, and think intentionally. So you experience that trigger, allow yourself to breathe into it, feel it, accept it, and then think intentionally as you move through through your life. And the six step breath process unpacks that a little bit more, but that's, that's what I use now. And I teach with uh, my clients, if I'm experiencing any sort of emotion, like rather than uh, just simply compartmentalizing it, which by the way, I'm going to send you this podcast. I think you dig it, but I did a podcast with um, my therapist friend um, who we, we talked about compartmentalization because I remember hitting her up last year and being like, yo, Alicia, like, compartmentalization i don't get this whole thing first of all it's a really hard word to say i need help pronouncing it <laughs> but <laughs> secondly like, like how is this a good thing uh, and what we landed on the podcast was basically 
compartmentalization is good because it helps you in the moment, but it's bad because most people never go back to open up that box. Because what we do is like, oh, I, I, I can't deal with this right now. So let me put it up on the shelf. Let me tie it up in a box with a bow and all of that. And then it's like, do, 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 do. you go about your day and then you never open that box and now it's just suppressed. And now that's part of why we experience dis ease within our bodies because we are lying to ourselves and not processing those energies that got stuck and stored in the body. Well, look, awareness is half the battle, right? True. It's actually the whole battle as far as yeah. I'm concerned, you know, being aware of how you're feeling. And before, I think a lot of people just stifle things and they just don't deal. They don't deal. They don't deal. It's that pretty box with the bow that you're talking about, but being aware, I noticed I work really hard on being aware and not stifling my feelings. If I'm, if I step my toe and, and my toe hurts and I feel like crying because the pain for that, you know, 30 seconds was unbearable, I'm going to go ahead and cry. I'm not going to try to stifle it and be the strong person. It's, you know, the body is in shock. I'm going to do what I need to do to release that emotion. And I think that's what people call leaning in. And, and being aware and leaning into that emotion and sitting in that emotion. And I've been doing that for about eight months now, you know, sitting with my emotion. You know, if I'm not feeling my best, why am I not feeling my best? What am I going through at that particular moment that is causing me to not feel my best? And what can I do to address that? You know, is it is it music? Is it meditation? Is it just simply doing breath work? Like, what can I do that's in my toolbox that will allow me to be my best possible self. So this is, opens up a really good conversation. And thank you for sharing that. And absolutely leaning in for sure. And um, feelings, where and how do feelings have a place in the workplace? So in your example of like, um, you know, if you stub your toe and, it, and you feel like crying, you're going to let yourself cry. Well, if we were to take it to like the workplace and maybe something goes really wrong, mm -hmm. a, a deal goes yeah. wrong and something like that. And there's an extreme emotion. How can we process that in an acceptable and safe way within the workplace? I think having someone, a, a designated person that can be that person to, um, to share what it is that you're going through is, is key. But I also think making sure that you have empathy in your corporate culture, that's incredibly important. Um, and that comes down to a hiring practice, mm -hmm. right? Making sure that you have a corporate culture that is empathetic, no matter what the journey is. You know, we have a lot of crazy energy that is in our world now, especially since 2020. Um, and all kinds of emotions stemming from politics, stemming from, you know, backgrounds, stemming from um, socioeconomic status. And, and, you know, it can all be overwhelming and it can all be too much. And everybody's got an opinion about something. Mm -hmm. So coming from a place of empathy first, I think is going to be mission critical for corporations because we don't all understand what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. We can think that we know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, but until you're actually in their shoes, we have no idea. And that was a huge leadership lesson, lesson that I had to learn because before I'd be like, well, just do the job, just do the job, right? Well, no, this person is human. They're not going to just do the job if they're not in a place where they're going to be effective and productive in, in their position. So um, empathy for me is a huge one. And to your point about awareness, I totally agree that awareness is everything. And it, it, if that leader is not working on themselves to become more self-aware, then mm -hmm. yeah, they may lead from that uh, place. So that's a really good um, point there as well. Now, I know DEI is really important to you as well. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So in 2020, um, it was a pivotal year, as we all know. And not just for the pandemic, but, you know, it was really going back to the Martin case, but then we had the Floyd case. And um, I was I was um, really honored to serve as the DEI co-chair for the AIM DEI Council for an organization that's in our industry. And we had nine months of programming that we offer to the industry for free. 
And through this, we had an expert come in and um, share with us some of the things that we take for granted in terms of we have no idea what it's like to be a person of color. Um, I do because I am a person of color, but not a lot of people do. And even through this programming, I was able to learn how I can be a more effective leader, more empathetic, understand that there are actions that we do daily that we take for granted, that we have no idea how that is harming another person. Seemingly innocent actions can actually harm another person. And it's it's going to take co us collectively to work on this for a really long time in order to overcome some of these challenges and, and obstacles that we have in really understanding what people are going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, you said this earlier and I want to circle back to it because it kind of came up again, um, not really understanding like what someone else is going through. And what comes up for me is a, about a year and a half ago, uh, a friend, someone who was coming to my men's groups that I lead here in town in Santa Cruz and became a friend, um, he his his son was born premature i think it was about three months uh premature wow. and i remember having he, it's a year later now his son's doing great and oh that's great i'm glad you said that because i was gonna start internalizing that worry <laughs> yeah i actually went surfing with our mutual friend and i i heard this friend is in in europe and he's got like this baseball business where he does like baseball tours and um anyways uh i asked my friend i was like uh so homie's in uh europe right now it's what about the the wife and the baby and he's like no they went too so the baby's uh out there in europe world traveler and just like turning one or something like that but he was um in the NICU, I remember this, uh, born, I think it was about three months early, and they had several miscarriages before this. And okay. I remember sitting with my friend and him sharing a story of like how it was such a challenging time for so many reasons, but part of the reason was people didn't know how to be around him and his wife. And one of the things that became very triggering for him, which was eye-opening for me, I didn't say it, but it was just eye-opening, was people would say to him and his wife, I can't imagine what it would be like. And I sat there with my friend yeah. And, you know, both of us being a little bit more, I would say, like coming from like the masculine side and like getting into yoga and mindfulness and spirituality and like men's work and learning to soften. And him just, it was just this very deep moment where he's not someone that would really like pause to make a point when he's speaking, but you could feel it because he, he had that intentional pause and he was like, sure, you can't imagine, just try. And just hearing that from him, that was just such a big epiphany for me being like, anytime I think I'm about to say I can't imagine, it's just ingrained in me now. Like, okay, try to imagine. It's almost like an avoidance, right? I can't imagine True. what that would be like. Meaning the subtext of that is I don't want to imagine what that's mm -hmm. like. And that's coming from a place of fear, right? Mm -hmm. That's my armchair psychology for the moment. Oh, a hundred percent. I agree. And it reminds me of a teacher I had, this is just coming through right now where he would say, um, this is like junior high or high school, but he would say like how people would say, Oh, you poor thing. And his point was like, one, people are not things. And then the energetic charge of, of whether it's like, I can't imagine, or you poor thing. Like, how do you think that feels for someone to receive that? You know, but they're less than, yeah. Words are spells, as someone likes to tell me um, on the weekly, <laughs> you know, words, words have energy. And, and that's another tool that I have in my toolbox, too, is reframing. And reframing is an incredibly powerful resource and tool to be able to do. Um, it takes practice. And I've been working on that for since January, really. And it, it's incredible how you can reframe something. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. For, for sure. You know, it's it's cliche, but I, I always say, it, and I think you heard me say this earlier today, but how are, how is this happening for me? Or this is happening for me. Sometimes we don't need to ask the question, but we can just remind ourselves like this is happening for me. Like that is one of the easiest 
and most accessible reframes to go from victim and mentality to being quote unquote, the hero of your own story. Absolutely. Or, or not even the hero in your own story, but just being your best self. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, what do you think about, um, this, have you noticed that there's kind of like a subtle movement of, of personal development into more of like a spiritual or soul development? Have you noticed that or what, what comes up for you? Oh, I totally notice it. Cause I'm living proof of it. You know, mm-hmm. um, it, it's becoming more acceptable and I'll tell you why I wanted to say this earlier in the podcast. Um, people think, and reason why I think corporations and companies aren't knocking down doors to implement wellness programs is because they're still with the mentality that it's a luxury. It's, it's, it's a, not a necessity. It's a luxury. And I think that is such an incredible um, misuse of, of their budgets and, and misuse of what they're able to provide for their employees. And they don't really understand if they were to provide something like this, how much more effective and productive their employees would be and how much pro- how more profitable that makes the company how stronger that company's foundation becomes you know and i i was the same i thought it was a luxury i'm like yeah. no we don't need to do that even going for a simple massage when my lower back hurt because i'm sitting in a chair all day and as an entrepreneur i'm sitting in my chair not just for 8 hours you know i'm sitting here 16 hours sometimes and you know going for a massage for my lower back. That's a luxury. That's not wellness. Well, you know, massage, as we know, helps the circulatory system. And if you have your circular, your circulatory system going full, full speed and, and at its, and, and at its optimum, why isn't that necessary? Why would that be a luxury? You know? And so I think we're, turning the curve here from being a luxury and an indulgence to actual, it's a necessity. Mm-hmm. It's something that has been proven to be effective. So why would we not now start incorporating it? And I think the pandemic is the reason that this now has been catapulted front and center into the world because now people are like, I need this. I know I need this in order to be my best self and to my, be my most effective as a leader. And also to be most effective to my clients, the people that I serve. So it's not an, it's not a luxury. It's not an indulgence. It's absolutely necessary. And more people should realize that. And insurance companies are starting to understand that because now some insurance companies for health insurance are offering wellness programs. They're, they're offering, um, you know, turn in your, your receipt, for you know, massage or turning your receipt for chiropractic work or therapy or whatever the modality might be, some insurances are now recognizing that this this is here to stay, and it's a profit it's a profitable business. I mean, the wellness industry, it's a billion dollar industry. Yeah, uh, I I I recently saw this, but I don't remember. It's got to be more than just a billion. I would imagine it's neither here nor there. It it is interesting though. The more I immerse myself back into like corporate business type stuff, because I really, you know, needed to take some time away from businessy stuff, especially during the lockdowns and all of that. It was I, I saw as an invitation to just go deeper down like the spiritual path and whatnot. But I've been to a couple uh, events. I'm thinking of one particular where I went to a buddies uh, from college their real estate conference to support them and whatnot and three of the presenters were talking about mental health and one of them it was their whole thing and you know not to judge these people or anything like that um but i can feel judgment coming on so that's why i'm prefacing it that obviously but i could tell with one of them like she was kind of a shark you know like a real estate shark and it kind of felt like she was tapping into emotional intel emotional intelligence and meditation more to be a thought leader you know and i and i noticed that a little bit with the other ones and this is the place where personally i am being called to do more my own work right because if i want to live in a world that is more abundant and it's more you know um it's more cooperative is the word 
you know, and supportive, then that's yeah. great. A rising boat lifts all a rising tide lifts all boats. Right. right? Um, but at the same time, it kind of feels weird sometimes like it's seeing people that are established, then jumping on to a trend and going through like a weekend or even an online course for something like this. And then all of a sudden, like starting to facilitate. Meanwhile, I'm like, oh, I've been doing this deep work for a while. And I know plenty of people have been doing it way longer than me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. I think once it becomes more mainstream, it's it's going to be a daily occurrence for for everybody. Um, it really, I don't think has reached mainstream yet because I think there's still that mentality that people think this is a luxury. This is an indulgence. It's not, it's not something that should be incorporated. You know, Bob Hope lived to be a hundred and whatever. He had a massage every day, <laughs> every day of his life. He had a massage. So, well, I mean, you, there's gotta be something to wellness, right? I, I will say when I was in Bali for Kundalini teacher training um, uh, for a month, I got a, a massage almost every single day for a month. And massages out in Bali are somewhere around six dollars. Yeah, um, <laughs> a little bit different. But I came back feeling amazing. I mean, to your point, especially those Thai massages, especially if you're not fl- flexible and it can really get you in the more yogic type um, postures. But to your point, there's a ton of different tools and modalities. So you are the executive director of SAC, S-A-A-C, is that right? Yes. The Specialty Advertising Association of California. It's a regional association that supports our members who are suppliers of promotional products and distributor members who sell the promotional products. And on top of that, I mean, we haven't even gotten into like what you do for work and business and all that, but you're in, and I don't even talk with you about work. Like, I don't think ever it's always this stuff that's to me at least, and probably to you too, becoming a lot more fun to talk about, but you're a a co-owner, co-founder of um, your business. And then you also are an attorney. Is that right? (laughs) Yeah. I started out as an attorney. I was a litigator um, for for 10 years. And my husband was in the print industry and he came to me one day in 2007 and said, uh, print is dying. And if we want to keep our nice lifestyle, we've got to make some changes. And so I looked at him and he said, I would like to open up my own company doing what I'm doing now. Um, and also, uh, you know, taking on projects that my current organization doesn't want to take on. And my immediate reaction was fear. And I'm like, what do you mean our lifestyle is changing? Like, we have a really nice lifestyle. What are we going to do? What do you, why would you want to open up your own company? So I was really super unsupportive. Fast forward seven months, August 2007, I'm standing in Times Square and I'm standing next to a bus shelter. And Brian, Brian's line of work, he d- did pre press for those bus shelter posters. Like, that was our bread and butter. And I called him up. I used my pink razor flip phone, if you can remember those. And I said, Brian, I'm standing next to a bus shelter and you are not going to believe what I'm seeing. And he's like, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm not looking at a poster. I'm looking at a digital TV screen. And he was quiet for a moment and he goes, now do you get it? And I was like, oh man, (laughs) there's no way. So a year and a half later, he opened up AB Unlimited with the principles that were important to us, the values that were important to us. And Sony Studios was our first client. And uh, a year and a half after he opened the company, I joined as COO and brought in infrastructure, made sure that um, all of my useful corporate law training came in super handy for this company. And then I wandered into his office one day and I saw a bag with a logo printed on it. And I said, what's this? He's like, oh, I'm outsourcing this because our clients want this type of stuff. And I'm like, why aren't we bringing that in house? And he looked at me dead in the eye and he said, handle it. <laughs> <laughs> a month later, we are members of PPAI, ASI, all the all the letters. And, and uh, we've just been really fortunate. I knew nothing about the print industry or promotional products, but I didn't have to because I had a lot of great mentors that helped me and guided me. And to this day, I still rely on, on mentors. And I now am in the position where I can mentor smaller distributorships now. And it's been, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of running a seven-figure business. I'll tell you that. 
Oh, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, the promotional products industry is always going to have uh, a special place in my heart, you know, and uh, I love marketing. I love branding. I love graphic design. And it's somewhere around the time I started my company, which is Swagworks. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was watching Mad Men. This was around 2011 or so. And uh, I was just like, Don Draper, that's it. You know, the creative director. And that's kind of how I always saw myself. And there's something special about working in the promotional products industry of taking something from nothing and, and creating it into life and really working in collaboration with your clients. I mean, sure. I did plan. I'm holding a Chico state mug right now that I bought from the bookstore and I didn't sell to them. Um, that's where I went to school, Chico state, Northern <laughs> California, but point being that there, the, the, you know, I, I had my fair share of just taking an order and slapping a logo. I, I think we all do. Right. But when you get to a point of really being a partner with your client and really doing something creative, like it is so rewarding it is awesome. It, I totally agree. I totally agree. And one of one of the mandates that I have as current president of SAC is twofold. One, supplier centricity, meaning we have to make sure our supplier members are taken care of and that they do have an ROI because what we are doing post pandemic, things have changed drastically in terms of manufacturing, in terms of selling and in terms of people's budgets, companies' budgets being scaled down so significantly that marketing becomes an afterthought when it really should be the most important line item in any company's budget. And so it's really important to me that we make sure that we don't forget how important our suppliers are in, in the supply chain process. And for our distributors, not every company is a seven-figure company. And I recognize that. And I saw through the pandemic, all of these companies that were just panicking, making mistakes that were detrimental, not only to their distributorship, but to their household and to their personal lives. And I thought, you know, I have all this experience in law. I have all this experience being an entrepreneur. What can I do to help? Well, one of the things that we did was we created the promo lawyer so that we could have affordable legal access and services to those owners in the promotional product industry that would be able to have access to quest answers to questions that, that could possibly save an order that if that order goes wrong, can tank their company. And, you know, it just seems to me that there's plenty of resources out there for any given challenge, business and personal, but not a lot of people are willing to share that expertise. Mm. And I've been fortunate in having incredible mentors for us personally and in business. So I always said, hey, if we can survive this, that's going to be my mission is to help people. So when I became president of SAC, that was one of the things that I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that there were resources for all of our members so that they can move their needle forward. And if they don't know how to move their needle forward, here's some resources. Here's a collection of resources that they have access to. People like um, Harriet Gatter, who's an incredibly brilliant former distributor who's now an accountant, and now she's the de facto accountant for the industry, can answer any question that you have. People like um, Rosalie Marcus, who helps smaller distributorships with their sales. People like Gloria LaFont, who is a brilliant mind when it comes to marketing for smaller distributorships. And I could go on and on. Sam Kabert, who can help with overcoming the overwhelm because it is stressful running your own company. So it's it's been an incredible seven months. Uh, I have five more months to go. We have a trade show coming up in August in Anaheim, California. And uh, it's it's going to be so different from previous trade shows. And we want to make sure that whatever we do as an organization, we are helping our members move their needles forward as best we can. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And they, uh, I said executive director, I stand corrected, president. That's what I meant president. to say. Our president. Our executive president. director is actually Bob Levitt. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Titles, you know, whole thing. But anyways, so your show is coming up in mid-August at the time of this recording, at least. Tell us how this show is going to be so different than before. One thing that um, the pandemic taught us is that we're perfectly capable working remotely. And now as such, Amazon has also pushed that culture where we can just 
click the return button, push your finger on the return button, the enter button on your laptop, and instantly you can have, you know, whatever it is that your heart desires. Instacart, same thing. That mentality has really put a damper on attendance on in-person events. And the trade show has been declining overall in any industry over the last few years, post-pandemic even more so. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can gather all of our members and guests in one spot at the Anaheim Convention Center and make sure that it's an experience. It's not where you just walk in and you're just walking row after row after row, looking at things, not engaging not really being inspired. So this time we are doing it differently. We're making it an experience. We've offered our supplier members opportunities to privately engage with distributorship. We've offered our distributorships an opportunity to come to the show and not panic about having to leave the office, not being able to work because that's a challenge is you have to leave your office, go to the show, spend time at the show, drive back to your office and you're all the whole time you're worried about, I got to check my email. I got to check, you know, on this order, um, especially for smaller distributorships and solopreneurs, everything that they do, they they have to do, they have to manage. Oh, I know that own. well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're providing workstations um, mm-hmm. at the show where you can sit down, you can have a breath and check your email and then continue walking the show floor and meeting and engaging with the suppliers there. We're having different kinds of lounges. We're having quiet lounges. We have a massage lounge for our, for our members to come in and enjoy while they're walking the show. Uh, We have panel sessions on education where, you know, one session is, you know, how I grew my sales to a million dollars, what strategies were used to, to do that. Another panel session will be suppliers and distributors collaboration. How can we integrate in each other's lives to make that sale, to engage with new clients, how to tackle um, more complex projects and and, in using your supplier, relying on your supplier for that type of resources and support. Sam is also going to be a panel speaking member on overcoming the overwhelm. And then we also have a panel session that is going to talk about the intricacies of different aspects of our industry. And it's just really going to be really informative. We have um, opportunities to socialize. We also have the Disneyland extravaganza occurring on Thursday night, where it's an exclusive event inside Disneyland at Star Wars Galaxy Edge, the whole backdrop for that. And uh, it's going to be a night of networking, fireworks, music, open bar, food. It's going to be incredible. Oh, with this industry, you say open bar, I'm there. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, all jokes aside, though, that sounds incredible. And I just hear I'm going to Disneyland, you know, like, what do you want to do? I'm going to Disneyland, you know. So, yeah, uh, the entire event sounds absolutely just so well rounded. I'm so honored and humbled and grateful that you and Bob invited me to speak at the event and share the six step breath process of how to overcome overwhelm. In the this is how we make it mainstream stream by exactly. inclusion inclusion mm-hmm. that's how we make it mainstream and and i'm going to do everything that i can do to share my personal journey to everyone so that they understand that this is something that they can do if they so choose and then by exposing you know all the different tools that people can use some so simple as breath work right mm-hmm. and and teaching them so i'm so excited to attend your session and and see what else I can learn. Absolutely. We'll keep going deeper and deeper. You know, at the end of the day, it really is all so simple. With all of the different plant and earth medicine ceremonies I've done, breath work journeys and healing modalities, when when I feel like I get to that place of like, I'm there, that moment of samadhi, that moment of bliss or enlightenment, whatever word resonates with you, inner peace, where you just totally feel it. It's almost like the cosmic joke. That's the chuckle, right? It's like, oh, it's all so simple. But as humans, we tend to overcomplicate it. And that's okay because it's about what, Amy? Awareness, right? Yes. And you know what- and and then knowing that you're in control. Mm-hmm. And there's a phrase that I learned a year ago. Um, 
from Samantha Joy, an incredible, mm -hmm. incredible woman who is an identity coach that I started working with four years ago as well. And she said, how are you calibrating to your bliss? And I thought, wow, what a, what a weird phrase. What does that mean exactly? It means I'm in control. I'm in control of, of, of my environment and how I want to feel. And if calibrating to my bliss means that I wake up on a Monday morning at 7 a.m. and I want to go in the summertime to the pool across the street and just swim for a little bit, that's what that means. Or if I go get a massage or if I take time for myself to just sit and be and, and relax and de-stress, that's calibrating to your bliss. For others, it could be spending time with their kids or their grandkids or gardening or you know hiking or whatever that activity might be we are in control 100% and this uh, might get a little too esoteric for some uh, keeping this uh, episode of a podcast that goes very deep on spirituality uh, in the kindergarten lane if you will uh, for right now but i will say um we are each and every one of you listening you are the producer, you're the writer, you're the director, and you are the main character. And you can change any scene that you're experiencing at any point in time. And that's to your point of calibrating to your bliss. Really, this is getting into timeline therapy and so many other things. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, check out some of the other episodes and you can go deep on uh, topics like that. But we're going to Keep it there for now. Amy, this has been awesome having you on the podcast. Where can people connect with you, learn more about you, hear about the promo lawyer, anything else, and register for the SAC show? Absolutely. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, or you can register for the SAC show. If you're in the promotional products industry, feel free to register at SAC.net. That's S-A-A-C.net and register to attend the show. Cool. Now, all those links are in the show notes. And if you guys are interested in my breath club, that is a weekly Zoom session and daily, that is daily accountability on WhatsApp with other corporate professionals, other executives, entrepreneurs that want to better themselves to be more compassionate leaders and practice soul life balance. Check out the link in the show notes to join the breath club and my new book, Overcome the Overwhelm. Amy, Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time and I'm looking forward to seeing you at Disneyland. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.